Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is your boy, C I double Z Y, live action, back at it again, Kansas City, Missouri. But actually, we're in Overland Park, Kansas, at Leo Moreno Jr. Boxing Club. If your kid is on the on the playground today and they come home and they was getting messed with, you know what I'm saying? Like somebody, you know, tickled their ear or something, they didn't like it, and they need to get their hands right, you know where to come. Leo Moreno Jr. Boxing Club. If you are 18 years old, and you about to go to the military and you know that they're going to try to haze you or something. And you, and you need to get your hands right. Leo Moreno Jr. Boxing Club. If you are a CEO. <laughs> I need to stop playing, man. Welcome back to another episode. Thank y'all for tuning in. Today we are back at it again with another fire guest. Like I've been telling you guys for 170 something plus episodes. Really more. But you know, some people be getting shy. I don't want to drop the episode. And then I got to. <sighs> anyways, you know, we ain't complaining though. Um, we have an amazing guest, and if if you haven't seen her on screen yet, you about to see her three, two, one now. Go ahead and introduce yourself to the camera to the folks. Let them who let them know who you are. I'm Laronda Lanier, and I'm the owner of We Got It Covered Food Services and Safi Fresh. I love it. I love it, ladies and gentlemen. I was uh at a meeting with a gentleman. I feel so bad for getting his name, but Michael, I believe it's Michael Mackey, Michael Mackey. That sounds about right. I don't know if that's true. So if it's not his it name, like you made it but I th- it sounded like it might be it. I don't know. But um, my brother from the pitch, KC, um, does a lot of dope write-ups on restaurants, businesses around the Kansas City metro area. It was like, you know, here's a list of like five people you should interview in the, you know, food and, you know, minority black owner businesses because that's primarily who i speak to on this podcast and brought up your name connected with you on linkedin this is over a year ago and kind of just been you know trying to find the right time to make it happen and we've made it happen here at the end of 2023 so thank (laughs) you for the 40 minute drive through uh hail Mm -hmm. snowstorms ladies and gentlemen y'all don't know but it's 37 inches of snow outside (laughs) She, she drove and she drove here like that, 40 minutes. Yep. She hovered, though. Plow. Yeah, she got a little snow. <laughs> <laughs> she got a snow plow. She was going crazy down 291, <laughs> just zooming. But anyways, thank you for making the effort to come out here today, have a conversation with me about your business, a little bit about your upbringing. And uh, with that being said, we're going to jump right into it. So, LaRonda, am I saying your name correct first and foremost? Yep, or you can call me Rhonda. Rhonda, okay. Could you please share with us, why, how, and why, if it was your parents, or if it's you, or if there's some grammatical thing I don't know about, that there's a capital R in LaRonda and a capital N, I think. Maybe you I'm tripping. Ask my mama. But that was purposeful. Like, that's in your birth certificate. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, have you asked your mom? No, I haven't. I've never really wondered, but I always make sure people get it right. So There we go. <laughs> now, is that does that change up how I'm supposed to say it? Is it like the pronunciation of the R supposed to be stronger? Nope. That is so interesting. I've been wondering that for a year. Really? And just looking at your name on LinkedIn. I'm trying to... I mean, we'll have to go back and look at the messages. I'm not trying to pull out the I receipts look, like that, yeah, but you know. I'm going to go look it up when we get <laughs> but out But I'm, I'm pretty confident it was like 12 months, you know, initial message, you know, follow-up message, you know what I'm saying? I feel bad. But no, nah, it's all good. Life has so, been hectic. Hey, listen, you are way more busy than me, so trust and believe I'm not complaining. I'm just grateful you're here. Yeah. So... Talk to me. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Are you a Kansas City born and raised, or are you from like Topeka, Ohio, or some shit like that? Like, uh, where where are we coming from? Where where's our whereabouts? Is that a real place? No, I just made that up. Oh, okay, so I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and I was raised in St. Louis, kind of back and forth a little bit, and then I moved back here when I was sixteen, I believe. Mm-hmm. And yep, just been here ever since. So back and forth from like zero to 16, like literally like a year here, a year there or? Not necessarily okay. a year here, a year there. I just went there when I was younger and then I came back here when I was about 16. And so. what was that What was that transition like? Were you already familiar with Kansas City well enough from like driving down here on weekends or anything like that to where it wasn't like a shock or, you know, because you're a what, sophomore in high school at that time, junior in high school? Uh, transparently, since uh, St. Louis is like a very black city, mm-hmm. like 
And the older I get, the more I'm realizing, like, I grew up in the hood, <laughs> like in mm. a hood hood. So <laughs> She's like, it took me a while. <laughs> it did. Like, the older I get, I'm like, uh, but because we didn't, like, really realize it when we yeah. were kids. We were kicking it. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, then when I came here, I went to Raytown South, which was, like, super diverse. So mm -hmm. it was almost like culture shock for real. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's real. That's real. You, adjustment. What high school were you at in St. Louis for those St. Louisans listening <laughs> right now? I was at now. Vashon. If you know anything about you St. Said Louis, Va what? Vashon. If oh, you hell know nah. about St. Look, Louis. Look, if you told me that you went to a high school called Vashon, <laughs> I'm just going, I'm stereotyping immediately. Not stereotyping yeah, no, you, you know, but I'm stereotyping no, that high school. I'm like, ah. <laughs> I'm like, ah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you so. went to what school? Yep, school on the north side, so. Okay. What about sports? Was sports a thing in your lifetime in high school? Uh, Yeah, I ran track for a little bit, but. Um, I was like not super committed to it. Not super committed. Yeah, I mean, I ran for like two and a half years. I quit like in the middle of the season. So. so, so what do you remember being your strong interest as like a teenager? What do you remember being like super passionate about? And please don't say like Backstreet Boys or something like Negative. that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was I passionate about in high school? Um, really just making sure I graduated. To mm. be honest, like high school was a crazy time. So. You know, if you grew up in the hood or the inner city, you know it can be very tumultuous. So, yeah. yeah, it was a crazy time. So, really making it through high school. And then I just made sure I surrounded myself with good people. Like, I still have the same friends, you know, from high school, really. So I love it. And do you still communicate with friends from high school from St. Louis as well? Yeah, I do. Okay, yep. okay. Because let me tell you something. Excuse me. Let me tell you something. High school friends. I'm just playing, but not nah, like for real, for real, I find it really challenging to like stay in communication. I want to ask you how you've been able to manage this, um, you know, growing to teenage years, twenties, like developing as a human being, developing new interests, becoming more mature, having, you know, new desires, especially as an entrepreneur. Not everyone is, has the, the desire to build a company or, um, maybe not work up the ladder in corporate or maybe not work at the Amazon warehouse forever. Like, I mean, and, and no, no diss to anybody, but I'm just saying like, it's always been a challenge for me to maintain relationships with people who don't have similar vision or goals because the conversations just become boring or dull or they don't, they don't feed, they don't feed what I'm focused on right now. So it feels almost like a waste of time to like connect with these people. And it becomes very hard to like, yeah, I love you, but when I come and sit down with you, I don't have nothing to talk about but old times from high school, which are probably similar to yourself, aren't always the most positive memories. Some of them are positive and fun, but a lot of them revolve around, you know, people passing away or this person being locked up or this person doing this or doing that. And that's what we're bonding on. But I don't want to bond on that type of stuff. Yeah, you feel me? Talk about so, shit, so, yeah. So, like, how have you been able to, like, have you guys all just been interested in similar things in terms of your passions and hobbies? Or how have you maintained those relationships for the past few years. So I don't, everyone that I'm friends with is not from high school, right, but right, my right. best friend, we went to high school together. Both my best friends. Mm -hmm. I went to high school with them. And that's something that I'm trying to like navigate now. So recently I started watching girlfriends again. Mm. You can take some inspiration from that. Okay. I, I can too. But, um, I have been taking inspiration from it because if you look at that group of friends, everybody is at a different walk in life. Mm -hmm. Like you have Joan, she's like this super successful lawyer and uh, I forgot the hippie girl's name. Oh, I forgot her name, but she has, like, no money. She's always, like, bumming off her friends. But they all, like, support each other, and they lift each other up. And I don't know. It's kind of hard to, like, navigate that really or find, like, that medium, you know, of who you can, like, keep around. And because I've shedded a lot of people along the way. Like, the more, the higher up I go, I don't know why I don't like using the word successful. Everybody's mm -hmm. like, oh, you're successful. I'm like, am I? I just say, like, uh, I'm, I'm elevating. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the more I elevate, the more people I shed. So I have noticed that. But, like, my best friends, though, you know, they don't run businesses or anything like that. But I don't know. They're very, like, uplifting. And I guess we just all accept that we're all at, like, different walks of life right now. For real. I love it. I love it. I think it probably just goes back to, and, I, and one of the words I don't like using is energy, but it goes back to, it goes back to like the energy someone brings into your circle or into mm -hmm. your life. So although they're not, may not be, you know, similar interests anymore, you guys might be at a different place, but the, the love they bring, the kindness, the support in, in what you're doing it just, it feeds your soul. So you're like, I'm going to keep you around <laughs> yeah, and I'm, a, and I'm going to feed much. your soul as well. Like I'm, I'm, I'm excited to like 
Like Usually. I only listen to my best friend, uh, mm. one of my best friends. She lives in Georgia right now. And she's a mom. She's a stay-at-home mom. And then she does, like, uh, insurance and stocks and stuff like that. Like, she helps people, like, build their portfolio or whatever. I don't know the proper terminology for it. But, like, she's, like, super uplifting to the point to where, like, I won't listen to anybody but her. I don't know why. I love it. I I don't know why. But that's powerful, though. Like, especially if it's somebody (laughs) you trust. You know what I'm saying? Like, if it's somebody you trust and they're giving you a good word and and that's that's who you're listening to, it's better than some stranger on the street where you don't know their... uh, what's it called, their uh, intentions, you know, because a lot of people will come into your life with some motivation, some inspiration with a end goal. True. You know what I'm saying? Whereas someone like probably your best friend just love you. Their only end goal is to just make sure you feel loved. You know what I'm saying? So that's pretty gangster to me. You mentioned that she's a <laughs> she's a mother, and I believe you're a mother as well. Of mm-hmm. What a eleven year old, ten, ten. Uh, okay, slow down. Oh my bad, my bad, my bad. So talk to me about parent life um we'll, we'll talk about the intersection of 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 parenting and running a business because i'm sure that can be extremely challenging but mm-hmm. i hear that your daughter um was the inspiration behind why you started we got it covered yes. um as a business can you kind of share that story or why she was an inspiration for that yeah because i wanted to just be able to be there for her like as much as i could really so like It's probably corny or cliche, but I want to take her to school. I want to make sure I'm there when she gets out of school. I want to make sure her grades are up to par, just push her, you know, to her fullest extent in gymnastics, all of those things. And working like a normal nine to five, I couldn't do that because the job I had at the time, I would go to work at 6 a.m. and you couldn't get off until you were done. Mm -mm. So sometimes I'll be going until seven or eight o'clock at night. Mm -mm. Yeah. So I'm like, "Uh, I can't do this because I can't. I'm missing school plays and things like that. And I'm like, nah, this is not going to work. So I don't know. It's crazy. I just figured it out. Hmm. How scary was that, though? Uh, Completely. Of course, I called my mom like everybody Mm -hmm. does. And I'm like, I'm about to quit this job. (laughs) I'm like, I can't do this no more. Uh, I left one company. I tried to go to a different one. And, I mean, they operate the exact same. So, I can't do this. So she was like, just make sure you're at least making enough money because I was running. We got it covered and working mm-hmm. for about maybe two years. And so she's like, just make sure you're at least bringing in enough money that you're, you know, to match the amount that you're making from working your nine to five. And I was. So I'm like, oh, let me go turn my equipment in because mm-hmm. I'm out of here. Yeah. Have to look back. So. So how did you like manage that? Uh, that that transition, though? I love I love that mindset, although I've never uh, I've never. I've never actually uh, followed that mindset in terms of making <laughs> sure your side hustle or your business at the time is making at least as much as you'd be making from your job before you decide to make that transition. I've always. What'd you do? Hey, you know, went broke, come back, get a job, go broke again, oh, no, come back, get, back a get a job. <laughs> I cannot. Hey, look, but <laughs> on, on, the, I, on, on, on the bright side, I did, I, I made these uh, quote unquote dumb decisions when I had no kids. So I ain't got no kids right now. So I ain't got nobody to look after but myself. So if I that's can't good. eat, it's okay. It's you can't feed okay. your child. That's a different story. And uh, I like hey, look, you know, stuff. I like to eat too, but I could survive <laughs> off some bread and beans for a few weeks if I got to. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. When I was in LA, ladies and gentlemen, I tell the story all the time. There was a little gas station across the street from my apartment building. Well, it wasn't mine. Me and my brother's apartment building mm-hmm. in uh, in uh, Calabasas. Used to go over there to the little store, this Armenian-owned uh, convenience store. It's my guy, cool-ass Armenian dude. Um, anyways, uh, so him and his uncle owned the store. I used to go in there. It was a liquor store, actually. And they had uh, black beans. They had little danishes, you know, little snack danishes or whatever. And they had, like, these little croissant things and milk. That's what you used to eat? But if that check wasn't hidden. <laughs> <laughs> If that check wasn't hitting. Hey, look, oh, I was survival. I'm a survivor. Man. I was singing that song on a daily. You know what I'm saying? I used to have yeah. to take the trolley to the to the bus to the train to the trolley to get to work and stuff. It was gangster though. It was good times. You know. That's why I don't want to live in a big city like that, like New York or something like that. You know. You ain't trying to go through that. No, keep me in a small town. And you know, like <laughs> when I go to LA, which I go often, you know, the customer service ain't as good mm-hmm. as it is here. You know, the people who are rude, and then, you know, we're from the Midwest, so you bump into me. Clearly yes, ma'am. Fight. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, but down and there. And we're going to fight. Yeah, but down there, it's not like that. It's like, oh, you just in my way. So. That's true. That <laughs> I, I feel like I didn't notice that in L.A. when I was living in L.A., but I've had siblings that have lived in New York and still have a sibling that's there, and my lady's from there. So, like, New York a lot growing up. 
that's a place where they really be bumping into you and acting mm. like it's normal. And I'll be ready to square up so fast. And I'm a con dude, but yeah, like three like bumps in a row, that's a different story. You can't hit just... me. And then the next dude hit me. <laughs> then your dog like pee on my shoe. And then you hit me. Yeah, and you expect me to not be you mad. You just got jumped. But it, that part, that it's part. Like to me. You know, hey, Esau, <laughs> Esau, shout out to the producer, producer Esau. Um, every time I hit this mic, man, I got to go back to my Mike Jones because I'm not going to lie. It's a, you got to throw that sound in there. You hit the mic and you just Mike Jones. But anyways, we got it covered. We got it covered. So what do you have covered? Break it down into, you know, when, when you launch this business. So you're still working your job and you launch. We got it covered. Mm-hmm. What was the, in, in, like, what was the plan? I'm going to make this type of food. I'm going to only do catering. I'm going to like, what was your initial business plan when you first launched? Initially, I was doing a catering, private chef, and meal prep. Okay. Private chef. Talk to me about that. How many private chefing experiences, like, have you done, and how are they? Because when I think private chef, I think, okay, that got to be a vibe. You in there with, like, a family of people or maybe a couple or something, and you, you, you got roses with the chocolate next to the cake. You know, I don't know. Talk to me about your uh, we got to cover private chef experiences, if you've had any that stand out. Yeah, I like doing the setups. Okay, okay. Um, tell, me, tell me a little bit more about that. The setups are cool. You know, they're real bougie. You can have... You know, just real elegant setups. Mm. But what I don't like is that you don't make as much money Mm, versus catering. Okay, Uh, well, I I guess it kind of makes sense in my head. But could can you charge like crazy? Okay, imagine you about to do a private chef experience for a a cheese player. Couldn't you just be like, you know what? I already know they're making a cool little two mil. You know, it's a private chef experience. I could just I'm gonna be there for two hours plus the food. I charge a little bit. Okay. $5,000. $5,000. Ain't that price gouging? Yes, you're right. My bad. And this is why I'm not a chef, ladies and gentlemen. This yeah, is... nah. They get charged unless... Uh, the only way you'll get upcharged is, is if it's like super last minute. Okay. Yeah. So, so okay. Like, I need you here in two hours. Oh, hell nah. Yeah, I would have been mad just initially. You, you got to know the food probably ain't going to hit as much at that point because you're going to... I would assume. You gotta move fast. I would assume. I'd be like, look, if, if they moving fast, I probably just pulled them away from their kids. My food ain't gonna taste as fire as it should be. You gotta give them a twelve hours notice. These people do not care. Okay. <laughs> These people do not care. We got it covered. Does private? Uh, it started off with private chef. How do you say that? Private chef experiences. Private chefing. Private yeah, chef. Or personal chef. Personal you know, chef. All different versions. Catering and then meal prep. Yes. Which one did you enjoy the most? And which one would you say is the most profitable? Catering, that's why I'm still okay. doing it. Both of them. All right, yeah. cool. So, I don't do private chef or meal prep anymore. Beautiful. So <laughs> let's dive 100% into catering. So if you could break down how, let's say, is there is there a, 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 a catering experience that you could like give us a full breakdown of? Maybe not the exact numbers, but of kind of how it works. So I know you list a few um, organizations you've worked with. Is there something you can come to mind to kind of give the breakdown of how the business side works? Like first, they I ask how many people there are, and then from here, I got to go buy the food from here. Could you break down that full process? So imagine I'm a company. I got 50 people. I need a catering experience. It's here at the Boxing Club in Overland Park, mm-hmm. and I'm going to have 50 people, and I need uh, lunch catered. So what do you need from me? What questions are you asking? Let's go from there. So I would ask you, um, well, you already gave me the address, so I would ask you your menu, and I'd ask you if you had a chance to look at the website. We have three menus online. Or I would give you the option of building the menu for you based off the type of event you have. Um, After that, I would ask you the date of your event so I can make sure we have it available because right now we can only handle two events per day. So that's pretty much what we do. Mm -hmm. Two two a days is what I call them. Um, After that, we'll decide your menu. I'll get you a quote. Uh, You have two options for payment. You can pay a deposit or you can pay in full. But regardless, all the money has to be paid in full before I go in and cater for you. Uh, After that, we just show up the day with your food and, you know, set it up for you. Now, if you're having like a more elegant event, like a wedding, Mm -hmm. it goes like more in depth. Mm -hmm. So it depends on um, the venue you have. Most times I'll meet up with the coordinator and do like a walkthrough of the venue um, it's just way more hands-on and way more communication with the brides and everything. And, you know, we'll bring in metal chafers and you decide if you want to add like a decor package, 
you give us your colors. So it's a lot of moving parts. Like it mm. just really depends on the type of event you're having because a lot of events we do for companies are just like staff lunch or they'll have like a holiday party. So it'll be drop off service or we'll have like a, we call them disposable metal chafers, but really you can reuse them like over and over again. Okay. But on our end, we just call them disposable. disposable. Yeah. Okay. So imagine, you know, or give us, give us an example of one of the uh, meal options that you have on your website really quick. Um, one of the meal options. So we have three menus. We have, or a, that's what I mean. Menu options. Sorry. I, yeah. I got you. Uh, so we have a regular menu, which is available year round. And then we have a seasonal summer barbecue menu, which is available from the end of spring, I believe until like the beginning of fall, somewhere around there, maybe October, something like that. And then, uh, we have a seasonal holiday menu, which has like all the good holiday peach cobbler, all that stuff on there. So we have a lot of different things. We have like a sweet glazed salmon, uh, garlic herb mashed potatoes. We do sweet glazed carrots, all kinds of things. So on uh, the catering side, it's more like soul food. So meatloaf, um, everything you really can think of. We have taco bars, uh, box lunches for corporate events and things like that. But on Safi Fresh side, I'm like really big on health and wellness. Mm-hmm. And technically I'm pescatarian. I only eat seafood. So, yes, um Safi Fresh is like an ode to like my, I guess, like my uh, obsession for health and wellness. Yes, ma'am. Because I don't even know if it's really an obsession. It's just like a lifestyle for me. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah so. I love that. So the how do you make sure that you don't lose money on a catering event? Like I always wonder when people do catering, I'm like, okay, obviously they don't just got this food sitting in their kitchen. You know, I mean – Sometimes, sometimes, like <laughs> because so, uh, we two a day turn it over. Yeah, okay, the so over is so heavy. So you keep the you know you have the main menu options ready to go depending on time of year, of course. Yeah, I mean, give um, or take. Like, say we may have like one box of chicken wings left mm-hmm. or something like that. So I'll hit up Restaurant Depot and have them deliver like two more cases of wings. Okay, so got you. Good. So you have it on on deck, so you're ready to go and cook these menus. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like you have to have somewhat of a set menu in order to be prepared, essentially, because that's what I've sure. always wanted. And, to be. People um, can't just call and be like, "I want this. Right. I want I this mean, and tomorrow." You can, but I'm going to upcharge you if you want something like a, a customized menu. Then mm-hmm. I'm going to upcharge you because it's not, you know, something that I carry in my inventory. I have to go out and get it. So okay, got you. And then. Yeah, like, I don't know. This sounds, I'm really, I'm really, yeah, and that's what I'm really trying, that's what I'm really trying to understand here is 100% like the, the, the business breakdown side of it. So like upfront costs, you're going to buy all these menu items that you know are on your menu. So let's say that menu that's available year round, you're going to have that in stock at your kitchen, Correct. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Oh, okay. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. No, I'm just. I'm about to walk I'm myself like, through, so I, I'm gonna talk out loud, so I can get to my. And I then forgot, so I gotta talk. Out loud. You good? You good? So you were like, wait a minute. Uh huh. I I'm said like, yes in my head. I didn't say oh my look. Just yeah, you like you right. You right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. So you have it ready on deck, ready to go. When do you? What's like? Isn't there a danger in that? In the fact that what if like there's a a week or two where business starts to get slow really fast, and then you just have all this stock like a food. It you is, but yeah. um, I'm able to keep up with like the sales volume mm-hmm. because I'll be in business seven years next year, so mm-hmm. I'm pretty. I can keep up with when it's going to slow down and when like holiday season is crazy. It's right. very bizarre. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like wild around here. So I have to keep. <laughs> I got to keep it fully stocked. But um, outside of that, yeah, I just make sure I pay attention to, like, my sales volume and everything. And then that lets me know what I need to keep in stock and how much I should keep in stock. Okay. Like, uh, my highest selling thing, uh, people love fried chicken. Mm. So, I got to make sure I keep cases of wings in Mm -hmm. stock. So, I'll have way more chicken than I'll have spiral ham. Got you. Okay. That makes sense. And so... All of this is ran out of your location in Crossroads and out, or out of that kitchen. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so from there, where, like, do you have a team or is it just you by yourself, like, going to a catering event or do you hire off, like, a website to bring extra workers in? How does that work? So you get a call, 50 people. We want the, the regular menu and we're doing salmon and mashed potatoes and green beans with, like, 
the cat what's it called the the uh the little bread that has the brown on top white on ciabatta. the ciabatta bread or something i don't know what the the standard menu let's just say the standard menu and you and you make enough for 50 people so if the event is tomorrow have y'all already started making it the night before or y'all make oh, day nah. of how's that work no nah, we'll probably start cooking like maybe uh depending on how many people we have to cook for is depending on the start time but 50 people we'll probably start cooking like two hours before mm-hmm. okay. to your event and Perfect. then the the meat is always cooked last of course of course and then you put it in the uh Get ridable, <laughs> re- re- reusable. Uh, 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 the uh, we put them in the uh, aluminum pans. There you we know, go. That's the word I was looking for. And then we transport them in cambros, which are hot boxes. Yes, yes. Yeah. I remember. I remember those. I done burnt my finger on a few of those. They get real hot. Oh, like, they sure do. Yeah, they get extremely hot. They sure do. People underestimate them because it's just like a what is it foam, like mm-hmm. really thick, thick foam. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, they used to have like the hard plastic. They used mm-hmm. to be so heavy to carry, but now they're like way more convenient. So. That's nice. That's nice. Just don't burn yourself now. Uh, you're like, mm, already did that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's two hours before the event. You guys start cooking. You get all the food ready. You pack it up the way it's supposed to be packed up. You load it in a van, mm-hmm. I assume. You hop in the van. You pull up to the event. Like, who's doing the pull-up part? Who's doing the packing it up in the van? Like, uh, It depends. Like, uh, a lot of times I'll be in the kitchen because it's very hard, like, uh, putting people in charge and, like, letting go. Mm-hmm. And, I was there running a business so long and I don't get complaints. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I call it the white glove treatment. Mm -hmm. So like whatever my clients need, I make sure I get it taken care of. Might cost you a little extra money, but I'm going to make sure I do it. So I don't know. I just don't get complaints. I get praises like all the time, but it's, I think it's because I'll go above and beyond, you know, you can call me at the last minute and uh, you know, I just had a client call me. I think I, cater for them Tuesday, a hundred box lunches. They called me today and was like, we need to add 80 more. Like, That's fine. I got the inventory. So, <laughs> so yeah, you just, I don't know. You just make sure you, you treat your customers or I call them clients. You treat your clients, right. You don't get any complaints and it's just very hard for me to like, let go all the way. So yeah, because you're not sure if somebody, I mean, at the end of the day, you can't expect somebody who, who didn't start the business to love it and care for it exactly. as much as you did, no matter how, no matter how good they are at their job, if they don't run that. But you can find people that care. I mm. genuinely, Like, I have some really good employees right now. So I really believe, like, you can find people that find somebody that really enjoys cooking and put them in a restaurant. They're mm-hmm. probably going to care a little bit more. Yeah, of yeah, course. So. Of course. I love that. Mm. And what was, like, the start of your cooking adventures? Like, how did you get so skilled and interested in food? And why was catering the idea? Why didn't you start, like, a digital software company? Like, <laughs> um, like um, where, where did the uh, love for food come from? I've always just, like, watched my aunts in the kitchen cooking. And my grandma used to make us, like, clean chitlins and all that stuff when we was younger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I just remember being a kid and like I'll be mixing different sauces together, just trying to make stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I was doing it. Now I do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like subconsciously, because really after high school, I wanted to go to school to be a lawyer. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm like, but I've always cooked. I've always done like extravagant setups for my family. So I don't know. It's like I always reverted back to that. And then one day a friend just was like, you need to try, you know, meal prepping. You know, you need to try like cooking for other people. And I never thought like I that's I just remember saying vividly, like nobody's going to pay me to cook for him. Mm. Yeah, and, and like, psh, then what happened? Ain't no looking back now. <laughs> but, for, but dive into that moment, though. Like then what happened? Like, what do you remember the first time you sold a plate or sold a meal prep service or sold a catering service to somebody? Do you, do you have that yeah, in your do. memory? Can you talk about that? Yep. Shout out to Passa. Uh, Santisa, uh, if she, I know you're gonna watch this because I'm gonna send it to you. But uh, yeah, she was the first person that booked me for a gig, and I think we were at like the Arts Tech Center or something like that, down like off Thirty First and I don't know Broadway or something like that. I don't know where we was. Anyways, it was at some venue, and I just remember we did like chicken waffles. But yeah, she was the very first person to uh, book me for a catering gig. So. Yep, I remember being there, like, vividly, like, setting up and everything. And how did that feel? Like, when you were done with that, how do you remember feeling? Were you like, wow, I really did that? finally. It took me six months to book my first gig after starting business. I love it. So you Stay down until you come up. There we go, that part. And so 
where you just post in like how did you how did you like market yourself early on and then how are we marketing yourself now so early on are you posting on instagram and uh facebook and just saying this is the meal item and taste and just making it colorful words of how it tasted like i guess how did you market yourself early on it was so crazy. I had like a menu I just typed up. <laughs> this is a crazy memory. Like, don't let nobody bully y'all. I'm just going to say that. Like, if you just now starting your business and you see somebody like is, you know, further ahead than you or if there's somebody around like trying to talk down on you, like try to take the good out of that situation. So when I first started my business, I had like a typed up menu, like a Word document and I was sharing it. And um, <laughs> somebody shared my menu. And I remember this lady, she was working for a car dealership and she was looking for a caterer. And uh, somebody like shared my menu and she was like, well, where's her website? And I didn't have a website at the time. I may have been in business for like a month. <laughs> like, I swear. <laughs> oh, my God. And she made me feel like so small for not having a website. Mm. Oh, well, uh, that's unprofessional. You need to have a website. I can't remember exactly what she was saying, but... No, she was talking shit. So, <laughs> That's what I remember. You know what I'm saying? I do remember that. Yeah. If, after that, I went and I built me a website on GoDaddy. And, like, it's, like, a fire-ass website. Like, ever it. since then, I get compliments all the time and everything. So, like, don't let anybody bully you. Use use those moments as, as motivation to go mm-hmm. create. It doesn't have to be you, you know, doing it for that person. But just be like, all right, I'm going to take that it? energy and I'm going to run with it. Yeah, because, hey, yeah. we're doing numbers now. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Sure. And so, shout out to one more time. What was her name? Pa- Passa. Pa- uh, Passa. Passa. She shout knows out. Who she is. Shout out, Passa. We appreciate <laughs> you. You were part of the uh, the the early story, the early journey mm-hmm. that uh, you know kept you going. You know, all the way to where you at now. So, for the at, so you said seven years in business now. Is that what I heard? Uh, seven in April. Seven in April. Crazy. So. From what year? So we're 2023. So what? 2015 or what year? 2016? 17. 2017. Okay, perfect. So 2017, you start and launch. We got it covered. Is the is is what you launched it as? Is that the mm-hmm. name you started it as? I always mix up my uh, my anniversary date. Hey, look, I don't know my anniversary date for is nothing. If I got to cater tomorrow. Babe, I'm and sorry. I, do. I don't know our anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> That's and all I do. I, know. Yeah. I don't even know what the date is. But I can tell you tomorrow and uh, the menu. I got this event, this menu, <laughs> and th- this many people, and this is what time I'm delivering. Hey, well, that's how you know you're good at your business. That's hey, all I can as long as you, you got did. that in order, right. Yeah, anything else, so, I don't know. So seven, uh, going on seven years, so 2017, how many years until you opened up like your first uh, kitchen that you were operating out of and, or maybe first location? Kind of just run us through the process. So what Collis is aware of from his research is Safi Fresh KCI, which we'll talk about the licensing aspect here shortly. Um, but Safi Fresh KCI, I'm uh, aware mm-hmm. of Safi Fresh Crossroads, or we got it covered, slash Safi Fresh mm-hmm. Crossroads. And I'm aware of your, we got it covered, uh, you know, catering services. So kind of shape that for us what what is Safi Fresh till we got it covered is we got it covered the main company Safi Fresh a concept coming out of that like could you help us understand the difference between this two and then yeah. the locations and how all that worked out if, yeah, if you so don't mind running through that Safi Fresh uh, we got it covered initially was the parent company of okay. Safi Fresh okay and um, I ended up forming Safi Fresh because I am very passionate again about health and wellness and I didn't want to do meal prep anymore. So I shut meal prep down Mm -hmm. and ironically I saw on the news like, um, this is before the airport was built Mm -hmm. of course, Mm -hmm. but I saw on the news like developers were wanting to meet with local business owners to see if they wanted to be involved in the airport Mm -hmm. and I missed the meeting. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, I Googled whoever was over like the city council member that was over, uh, everything. I got the guy's name. I told him like, Hey, I missed out on the meeting, but I'm really interested. Have no idea what I'm doing. Like, you know, like help me out. So he just told me like, uh, introduce yourself to, he sent me the list, introduce yourself to these people, tell them, you know, about your business, what you do in the community. And I told them like how much I volunteer. I told them how much uh, I was growing, you know, in sales every year and everything. And yeah, I had like nine developers hit me back. And only one of them wanted me to, uh, didn't want me to sign an exclusivity agreement, which is the company. Uh, It means like you can only work with that person. Exclusivity, like, so you can only exclusively work with that company. Okay, So if you sign on that, like, you can't work with another developer. Okay, gotcha. So I didn't sign with any of the other people, but the one company I went with didn't want me to sign one. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, we pushed forward, and I ended up winning the bid. And, yeah, I was like, um, initially, when I pitched them my idea, I'm like, I really want to do something with uh, meal prep. And I have all these nutrition facts and recipes and stuff left over. So I kind of modified the menu and I wanted people to know that uh, Safi Fresh was black owned. So I looked up like a cool word. It probably sounds ignorant, but I wanted an African word that meant like fresh or pure. Yeah. So quick, yeah. quick side note, I'm Tanzanian. So in my family, we speak Kiswahili. And in Tanzania, okay. when you say like when you're like seeing somebody in the street and you're like saying what's up, typically it's more like what's up, not like, hello, how are you? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not... It's more like slang, I guess you could say. Right. Like, yo, Mambo VP. And then you could say, Safi. Like, I'm fresh. fresh. Like, I'm fresh. Yeah. Safi, Safi. So you already knew what yeah, was up Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you. Yeah. yeah. So that's literally where I got it from. Mm-hmm. It means uh, fresh in Swahili. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, yeah. So I figured uh, I'll have, since I'm technically African-American, an African word mm-hmm. for fresh or pure yes, than ma'am. an American one. So yes, Safi ma'am. fresh, African-American. I love, American. I love that. That's yeah. fire. And... Break down the licensing aspect. What is licensing? And again, I know we're not sharing any names and things like that, but mm-hmm. would you just mind breaking down the la- licensing aspect of the KCI location and what licensing is? Yeah, so a licensing agreement is is honestly, uh, in elementary terms, you paying some or somebody paying you to use your idea, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, I came up with my menu, you know, I came up with everything, training material, uh, employee handbooks. I had to do everything. Like I really, uh, I want to really turn it into like a big corporation, but yeah, licensing is basically, uh, you partnering with someone to come in and run your business for you Mm -hmm. and you don't have to really be there and you take a lower percentage of the sales because you don't have to take on the debt or anything like that. So yeah, it was a million dollars to build a restaurant at the airport. Mm-mm. Ain't got no billion dollars. <laughs> Ain't got no million. <laughs> yeah, crazy. and it's my first time crossing over into aviation, but I learned a lot. Like now, I can do it by myself. So right now, we're working on expanding. I love that. Yeah, that's so fire. Yeah, I'm gonna so, see it's popping up at a few airports. <laughs> that's gangster. That's amazing. And King, are you? Do you? I assume you could, because people are going to be a little bit confused on the difference of licensing and franchising. Could is there anything that you could like clearly break down to kind of help them understand I'm the difference between at those two? Explaining things, you're going to have to help me explain this because I, I, I will. I will tell you my <laughs> guess, and you tell me if this sounds correct. Because first off, I don't know, but I'm going oh, to man. try. So <laughs> okay. my 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 understanding is licensing and franchising is yes, you are someone is paying you to basically use your ID. I just thought about a, a elementary way of explaining it. Perfect. I'm, I I want to just test my skills out real quick. Mm-hmm, and ahead. essentially, licensing, there, there's not, everything doesn't have to be strictly by the way the, uh, I guess, the owner or the creator. Like, you can put different ideas on the menu. It's a partnership. So you yeah. can propose different ideas or menu items. Let's just yeah. keep it. Well, whatever menu items I put on there to go there, mm-hmm. go there. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, after we set the menu, if I want to go and add something, since she's taking on the cost of adding that menu item, that's something we have to discuss together mm-hmm, and decide mm-hmm. if we want to do it. Okay, got you. So it's more of a discussion and a partnership and less of a this is what it is. For sure. That that would be how I understand yeah, franchising so, versus licensing. Yeah. Oh, I got to look into uh, franchising again. But licensing, like... Um, I still own that brand. Right. Like, no matter what happens. I okay. own all the recipes. IP. I own yeah. Yeah, everything, really. Okay, fine. I got to look into it. The, this is something I've been trying to learn about because uh, Revo Cup, I don't know if you've been to that coffee shop here in Kansas City. They have a few locations. They have one downtown, like, right at the edge of downtown going into River Market. They have a location down there. They have, a, they have a, like, a location in Lenexa. They have, a, like, two or three here in Overland Park. They have one over here in Town Center. Um, they have one on Quivira and 135th and one other one. Oh, man. oh no, no, I and, thought it was something else. <laughs> and they're a coffee shop called Revo Cup and it was started by an Ethiopian guy and now they licensed out the business and it's oh, owned. Geez. Then there's multiple other Ethiopians that own the other locations. There uh-huh. used to be, there was two locations where I knew they weren't Ethiopian. It was one, uh, the one on 135th and Quivira, which was this, uh, uh, Caucasian gentleman, really awesome guy, but I heard that he just sold it 
back to an Ethiopian guy. So the only one that I know is not ran by the the. I, I say this in a loving way, but the Ethiopian mafia yeah, is it's uh, like the family. They yeah, keep, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what people do. They keep black people the only people that ain't doing. They don't it. do that for real. Yeah, up. I mean, yeah, it's true. It's we true the only for sure. ones that ain't keeping it in our culture. Mm-hmm. It's like. I mean, some of us are. There's a small group of people like, you know, I got leads. You know, I can put somebody on very easily. But we are like the only culture that won't stick together. Yes, it's 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 interesting. It's kind of sad, man. It's interesting. I I feel like that's a whole dynamic to dive into with like a a black historian psychologist or something like that. Because in my head, I'm always like, well, okay, does it tie back to like just like. You know, it's because of slavery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what I tell my friends. Yeah. That's like one of my favorite scenes. They ask me because of slavery. Think about it. It all go back. It does though. Yeah, it does. Hey. I met a. I met a. What's her name? Uh, Joy DeGru. So if anybody watches this right now, you want to learn about uh, post traumatic post slavery syndrome. Slavery syndrome. I made that up. She wrote. Well, I, I made that up. I'm gonna go with it though because that sounded right. Post traumatic slavery. <laughs> Something I forgot, but uh, Joy DeGru wrote a book about it, and oh she's actually goodness. done studies like for the past like 10, 15 years. That's where her studies been around. I believe that's in a the real space. Thing. And, no, one hundred percent. Like you should go read her book. I it's fire. It. So I've met her, and she was really <laughs> cool. And she talks about this, but it's like it's it's a very emotional thing to learn about, though. Like for anyone, especially for Black people, but like me personally. I'm, I'm, you know, my dad white, my mom's Tanzanian, so I really actually don't have any ties to, like, you know, slavery in America. But, like, learning about that, I was like, damn, geez, like, that was heavy on my heart. Everyone else in the room was black yeah. American. They was crying, like, that was, like while she's educating us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's obviously very passionate about it. But I say that to say that it probably does go back to that. And, but it is, like, sad but also interesting to learn about. So that way you can, what is it called, uh, unlearn to relearn? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but yeah, I've been trying to learn about licensing because of Revo Cup. They have like one out of the one right here is the only one I know that's owned by a black guy, uh, uh, David, David, Brian. My bad, bro. If you watch this, I, I got your number and I don't even remember your names, man. Michael yeah, I'm, Mackey. honestly, Michael Mackey, David Bryan, <laughs> <laughs> David Bryan. I'm just using first and last names. Um, but okay, awesome. So we love that. I'm very interested in seeing how you grow that side of business just because I'm really interested in that space in general. So we can't wait to see Safi Fresh at uh, all the airports in the yes. country. One day I'm going to just be walking through LAX, you know. <laughs> Glasses on, getting ready to hop in my uh Shafford G Wagon that got mm-hmm. brought to the front, you know what just I'm saying? Because you know, just off my private jet from selling so much personal training services. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here training goddamn the the the, the prince of Dubai and shit. Oh, right, somehow, right. some way I'm gonna be in those G Wagons though. And I'm gonna see Safi Fresh and I'm gonna be like, I interviewed her. <laughs> and I'm gonna just smile big. Okay, now the right. uh the we got it covered. You said you, or the Crossroads location, you said you closed down until yes. January. So first off, I didn't even know that there it was open. I thought it was just a kitchen. So this is a place that people could pull up. Like I could just walk up it's and get food. It's a ghost kitchen. Okay. Yeah, it's a ghost kitchen. But could so. I, before you closed it down, because it's temporary, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah, um, so when I, uh, if could I have walked up or I only could have gotten food through DoorDash and like, oh no, you can walk up and order. It's like a whole kiosk and. Okay. Is it sim- yeah. Have you been to parlor? It's similar to the parlor, except there's no dine-in service. Okay. So is it, okay. It's see, right I'm around very the corner conf- from the parlor. It's like, two it's literally away. right by my house and I just haven't came this week because I just found out about that part a lot of your of people business. don't know yeah. about it, but shout out to all of my, uh, what do you call them? My neighbors. Yeah. In yeah, there. yeah there's yeah, like neighbors. 20 restaurants in there. Okay, but is it like, okay, okay, so there's no dine-in, but you can walk in, and you can see people in the kitchen, and you can order? No, you can't really see people, so you walk in, there's a whole, like, um, I don't know what to call it, like, a, a area you can, like, sit down in, uh-huh, what do uh-huh. you call it? Can't a, think of the word. A cafeteria shit, but not a cafeteria, nah. a, a, a seated area, like a dentist's office, like a... Lobby. There you go. There we go. Yeah, like a lobby. <laughs> I said the dentist office. Then there's office. a kiosk. You can order your food on the kiosk, or you can order it online before mm-hmm. you come. So then when you come, it'll be ready. You, uh, if when you come, if you order prior to arriving, you put your phone in front of the second kiosk, and then a locker pops open, and your food's right there. This is crazy. I gotta pull up there. Yeah. So, so, so I could just pull up there and order food on the kiosk, wait until it comes through the locker or something yeah, like but that. But I highly suggest 
ordering before you come because it can get very busy. Interesting. I don't know why. I literally, I've been in Nobody Crossroads for like seven months and I've never. They won't learned. advertise. It's called Cloud Kitchens. Cloud Kitchens. It's oh, Cloud. that's where. Or no, Crossroads Food Stop. That's what it's called. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because because I was on my phone and I'm uh I was seeing oh there's so many of these restaurants but I'm like where's it at? So I zoomed in building. on the map and it says something kitchen and I was like oh I know what this is because obviously said, yeah, I've talked about food stop. ghost kitchens and stuff. Called. Interesting. 16th and Campbell. 16th and Campbell. All right. Yeah. So uh, if you don't, and you can say veto, but what's the decisioning behind, you know, closing it down for a month? Um, I messed my hand up. Mm-hmm. I had developed uh, tendonitis. Uh, I got sick like twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I had just went through like a whole bunch of like uh, deaths, to mm-hmm. be honest. Mm-hmm. Like I lost the aunt. Two cousins and then an ex, like within thirty days. Oh, no. So it was just crazy. I'm like, yeah. I gotta take a break. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, so. ma'am. Well, I'm happy to hear that you're taking self aware and taking that time you need mm-hmm. for yourself to take care of your own wellness. Like you said, you passionate about wellness, but a lot of times people forget about that aspect from a mental health perspective and just being able to step away, even if it means you might lose some bread or even if it means you might lose some time with friends or family, or even if it means you might have to put a pause on business, whatever it might be. At the end of the day, your personal wellness is going to be the number one factor that's going to lead you to success if you don't dial it back a little bit so that Listen you can recover. Body. You know what I'm saying? I think uh, Joe Holder, he's a he's a uh, personal trainer slash wellness consultant, whatever you want to call him, that says it best. is like, you know, you can't go from sofa to red zone and be all right. Meaning, he's talking about specifically fitness, and I tell my clients all the time, you know, like, you can't just walk up in the gym from the sofa, being on the sofa for 10 years, Mm -hmm. and go, like, run a marathon and go super hard and be all right. That's not going to work. Your body is going to tell you what the fuck. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, my God. So it's the same idea when, like, you oftentimes have to train yourself, whether it's in the gym or whether it's through hard work to develop, like, resiliency, character, get to that red zone but then pull back and rest and reset mm-hmm. so that you can get back to green so that you have the capability and capacity to go to red again, if that makes sense. It makes complete sense. And, it's and, pretty much what I just did. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but that's, you know, like that's a part of it though. You know, it's a part of the process, especially in entrepreneurship for yes. sure, but really in everything. Like if you want to be the best at your job, it doesn't matter if you're a nine to five or not. Like if you want to be the best at anything you do, you're going to have to put in a lot of hard work. Mm-hmm. You're going to, you're going to get to that brink of burnout but you need to recognize when you're getting there so that you're self-aware enough to pull and don't back. Keep pushing yourself. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Pull back, reset, so that you can, you know, be ready to perform again when you're called upon, really, at mm-hmm. the end of the day. At so. your maximum capacity, especially exactly. because I like shot off whenever I got back to it. So. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. I love that. So yeah. one thing that we didn't uh touch on, uh one thing that we didn't touch on that I wanted to dive into is like how do you track your like uh Sales growth or inventory, things like that. Do you use some type of software? Is it all handwritten? Like, how do you pay? Is it off the top of your brain? Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. I don't know what type of operation you're running. So, Uh, QuickBooks. QuickBooks. QuickBooks is like worth the money. So, pay for QuickBooks. So, why do you say that? Let's dive into that a little bit deeper. Track everything: profit and loss, uh, yearly sales, uh, bookkeeping, everything, payroll, everything is in QuickBooks. And there are other. Other platforms that can do the same thing, but that's just my preference. And how did you learn to use QuickBooks, and how did you learn about QuickBooks? Like, when did you start integrating that into the business? A long time ago. I had an old mentor, which I won't mention his name either, but (laughs) he made me get QuickBooks uh, desktop, and I really didn't like it. And then after that, I think I talked to my mentor, Jill Hathaway, shout out to her, and she was like, no, you need to, like, get through the real QuickBooks, like QuickBooks mm-hmm. Accounting. Mm-hmm. And then she, like, hooked me up with her nephew, who's my accountant, and it just snowballed from there. So you kind of pay attention to sales growth there to decide what time of year is hot, what time of year is cold, so that you can prepare your finances and the business and make sure you're dialing things mm-hmm. up or back during whatever time of year. Sure. And now that you've been in business for almost a decade, you kind of have a strong understanding. It's crazy. It is crazy. Let me say that again. Since you've been in business almost for a decade, <laughs> <Crazy>. <laughs> um, you're able to have a stronger understanding of when you need to dial things up in terms of inventory, in terms of marketing, things of that nature, or dial things back because you already know it's a slow time of year and you got to conserve costs. Next year is going to be a little tricky because it's a uh, filling up like January is almost full. And that's normally January is like a slow month for me because oh. it's right after the holidays. Yeah. A lot of people are on break, you know, mm-hmm. and um, 
But I am crossing over. Maybe this year we became like 100% corporate catering. So everything okay. we do is a, a corporation. So maybe that's why. But I'm keeping my eye on next year because January normally is not like full the way it is now. So, so when you say you're crossing over and you've officially crossed over to 100% corporate, does that mean like if somebody calls in, you don't accept anything besides corporate uh, I'll still catering? take it. Sometimes You'll still take it here and there, but your goal is to focus 100% on corporate. Is that I what I heard? it's iffy because my community supports me, so yeah, yeah. I don't really want to, like, turn them down. But, I don't know, the price went up a little bit, so. Yeah. And, yeah. see, that's what I'll be saying, though. Like, that's what I, that's what, like, I know they're kind of two different, different things, but that's what I'm talking about. You ever elevate to a certain level and they still right here? And it's not even a bad thing, but you just elevate into like this thing. And it doesn't mean being right here for them is a bad thing. It's just you not there no more. That's just not where you at. Yeah. So I you mean, get if they still talk about the same stuff, you got to leave them behind. Right. But the same idea when it comes to your business, as your business grows, because I, f- I see this a lot in, in, in our community. They start hating when you start doing well because you are not like, again, it doesn't mean being here and being here means you're a better human or anything like that. But if your prices went up because they have to go up because you start seeing, okay, this is how I can grow my business by working with this mm-hmm. this uh, pool, and this is how I'm going to create the the wealth I need to take care of my family and the and the wealth I need to give back to my community, which we're going to dive into. The last thing we're going to talk about today is some of the volunteering you do, and I can't remember the exact name, but the uh, the uh, event you've been putting on for a few years mm-hmm. that we'll dive into shortly, but. Um, yeah, like you eventually you got to, all right, I'm going to start working with these people or my price is now, you know, 300 an hour versus it. You, when I first started, it was 75. It's like you might still be able to only afford 75, but I got to keep moving up. You can't hate on me and call me overpriced and price gouging now. I no. don't even pay attention to okay. those people. Yeah, either you're going to pay it or you're not. So, right. Yeah, that's just pretty much how I am. And then I believe, uh, I don't know, like haters and stuff like that i just literally it's like they don't exist i'll just be working like i don't think i'm better than nobody or nothing like that i just want to build you know generational wealth and become financially stable so i can take care of my kid absolutely absolutely either like people like that either you're gonna pay it or you're not like what's up like let me know so i can move on to my next client and then you can tell though like certain things like people will tag me in a post like um don't tag me anything that says uh reasonably priced like you know a, a caterer that ain't gonna charge that much like a certain word yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Hey, don't tag me in it y'all heard that <laughs> wait let's run that, that back hey do not tag we got it covered yeah. in any facebook post linkedin post instagram post twitter <laughs> post re- that says reasonably price. priced because yeah. i'm gonna charge what is necessary yeah, everybody Listen. can charge the same thing or how much would you charge me the same thing I charge everybody. Right. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, you're not about to get a higher cost just because. Yeah, or a lower one. Yeah, or a lower one. There we go. That part. You know what? Part. I feel like I can be totally transparent right now. One thing that we deal with, or I deal with, and I know I'm not the only black caterer, mm-hmm. is people coming to us because they think we're going to charge less or, like, give them a price break because, like, oh, like, I'm a big organization or uh oh like you can say you know you can use me hey it's i don't a minor, care who you I work are. with minorities now yeah yeah like mm-hmm. no you're gonna have to pay bro like rent is high okay <laughs> these <laughs> bills are high facts yeah so don't call us thinking you're gonna get a discount or you know are we gonna charge like a cheaper amount or you know we gonna like no it's just none of that that's happened Way in the past much, yeah. week probably six times mm-hmm. yeah and the answer is no there we go like the answer time. is no the answer is no. The right people will come shop. And I said, especially it's, when you really good. a test for real. Mm-hmm. Like to see like if you're ready, you know, whoever you believe in God or the universe, it's a test to see if you're ready for more. So it's like, okay, if you're going to keep taking these little gigs, you know, you know, letting people short you your money and stuff, then why I'm going to give you more? Just keep mm-hmm. taking, you know, that little bit. Right. Not me. That's a, that's real. That's yeah. real. I think that's something uh, as a, as a, personal trainer i've had to slowly like work myself out of that like oh yeah, yeah you can come in for a free session yeah free nah, here you need to know free your there worth, free brother. here free there free there it's like what am i doing no. yeah let me you run ain't got no bills yeah i do that's, why you <laughs> that's the thing like, that's why you eating them beans be and shit. bread she's like hey what you doing <laughs> She That's like, why you eat the beans and bread. Beans and bread. You're to beans give away and bread. Free yeah, like, hey, well now I shop at Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I need to go back to Aldi's because I was supposed to hit only three hundred dollars uh, spend this month, and it's at five hundred now. So that's what happens you when you show up. 
Nope. <laughs> nope. Matter of fact, I ain't even gained no weight and I've been trying. So anyways, anyways, we need to just shop at Safi Fresh only. You, you know need what I'm saying? You need to, eh? I'll get your diet in order. Do, oh, actually, I have a question. Yeah, I can get you to get Could me. I finesse, like, well, not finesse, but so could I get, like, <laughs> wait, like, see, because this is what I want to do. I had a homie that used to go to this uh, person and he would get, like, you know, a full, what do you, what do you call them again? The little plastic things, uh, the, the silver platter. Oh, like a full pan? A full pan mm-hmm. of meat. <laughs> and then that would be his meal. He would meal prep with that. Okay, you get that's what I'm smart. Saying? That's smart. So could I buy like th- four full plant pans of meat from you? Yeah, you could if you want to. You know what? We might have we might have to check. Cause that makes, that's actually very Joe's. smart. Yeah, you only got to make vegetables, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Anyways, I'm thinking about doing that. So now that I now that I got you down the street, you yeah. know what I'm saying. But to cl- to clarify, that is where you function and still the kitchen out of though, right? Oh, yeah, I just want to make sure you're still close to yeah, home. You know what I'm saying? Crossroads. All right, right say down, less, man. say less. So okay, last two questions. Um, when you think about growth, of we got it covered, and being able to a, get to that level where you can step away from the business a little bit more, have even more time with your daughter, uh, you know, scale in terms of revenue um, each year and like grow it into a, a conglomerate of, of Missouri, whatever. Let's we could say international, especially on the Safi Fresh side in terms of the licensing. I, I guess now that I say that out loud, I kind of know what your answer might be. But I guess what's like the growth plans? Like, how do you foresee yourself? growing into like a national organization that's able to make enough money to step out and take care of business and have that generational wealth. I want to, uh, well, I do want to take, we got to cover at least to St. Louis so I can have at least all of Missouri on lock. Yeah, and for plus, sure. you know, since I grew up there, yeah, home, I that's hometown there. too. Yeah. I kind of have an opportunity to do that, but I can only do one thing at a time because yes, I don't ma'am. have partners or anything. It's yes, only ma'am. me. And then, uh, of course, with Safi Fresh, which is now its own entity. Mm-hmm. So uh, I am a multi-business owner. Okay. But, me uh, up, me yeah. up, me up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I want to take it nationwide. Yeah. I like, it. Um, I really want to go to Atlanta because, you know, it's super black there. Mm-hmm. So that's on my list. Um, I don't want to give away all my plans. I love it. But I already, I already <laughs> see it. Safi Fresh, Safi Fresh is going to be in Atlanta. It's going to be in Maryland, mm-hmm. D.C., where are all the other black places? Shit. Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore, Louisiana. Detroit. Detroit. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well. And LAX. And LAX. I love it because, you know, when I hop out that G-Wagon, you know what I need. Mm-hmm. You know what I need? I need yep, some of that Sassy Fresh. Right there. And honestly, I kind of want to see you in Tanzania, too. Honestly, I'm going to get my money up and then I'm going to come call you. Come on. We can That's do a licensing deal. I'm going to get my money. I'm so dead ass. I'm gonna, <laughs> listen, we're going to put this on camera real quick. We gonna do Ladies a and gentlemen, deal. we're going to do a licensing deal within the decade. Safi Fresh to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Boom. All right. All right. Saying it right Getting now. It Putting it into the universe. Hell yep. yeah, because I'll be fire. Um, final question. I would love for you to share um, a little bit more about your, I believe it's a nonprofit or I believe an event yes. that you put on each year for about past five, six years. Yes. Um, and just break down what it is, what's the name of it, and how can people support it if they listen to this podcast? So it's a warm up KC. I'm actually looking into turning it into an official nonprofit. So it. me and my partner, uh, Alexis Fine, she owns Yao Body Care, which mm-hmm. is a body and skin care company. Uh, we used to like feed the homeless once a month. Like we'll just go out and I'll do like sack lunches and then she would do hygiene products. And literally once a month for maybe like two years, we was just going out feeding people. I love and it. both of our businesses started to grow. So mm-hmm. like we can't keep doing this, obviously. So we came up with the idea of doing uh, an event once a year and we just either go out and buy hygiene products and clothes. We take donations. We have coats, blankets, hats, like household products. And it started out very small. Like the first year we did it, we were in the Gates parking lot, like mm-hmm. outside. Mm-hmm. We just set up like a bunch of clothing racks. And like now we partner with Operation Breakthrough every year. Yes, so yes. I love it. Yeah, we have like a bounce house, a hot chocolate station. We do snacks and We've helped like well over a thousand people for sure, for sure. So I love it. That's beautiful. And how can people get involved in that? Should they reach out to you? Should they email you about when's the next event or like what what, what does that look like for people who might want to participate in that next time around? So we're always looking for volunteers and we're always looking for sponsors, which we never get. So if anybody's listening to this and you want to help us pay for some stuff, come and help us give back to the community. (laughs) So, yeah, we um, you can either look up Warm Up KC on Facebook or you can send me an email at info at WGICfood.com. I love it. I love it. And 
ladies and gentlemen, if you are a person that works for a corporate entity or you run a corporate entity, um, you know, people outside of that too, because she says she still she still might do a little do catering here, you know what I'm saying? But definitely, place. you know, being that we we try our best to promote this as a business podcast, if you run a business or you work for a business and you guys need some catering services, holler at We Got It Covered. The beautiful lady right here, LaRonda Lanier. Yep. LaRonda Lanier, and that's a capital R and a capital N, just if Period. you didn't know. Period. And uh, she'll get you right. <laughs> the food is going to be amazing. So you're going to get that white glove service. You're going to get some real beautiful, beautiful. I'm over here talking like I haven't seen it before, but I trusted it. The food beautiful. <laughs> You've seen it on LinkedIn. I've seen it on the internet. <laughs> Shit. Beautiful food. And if you are an individual out there, again, who's looking to get in business or are already in business, especially in the food space, you're looking to um, maybe look into Safi Fresh, maybe some licensing opportunities, then uh, hit her in the email. Would you like to provide your email or can they go find it by themselves? <laughs> uh, oh, info, I-N-F-O at W-G-I-C com. I love it. Is there anything else or anybody you want to shout out before we wrap up today's podcast? Um, Just all my family. Yeah, I appreciate them for always supporting me. Yes, ma'am. And if there's anybody looking to get into, uh, like, open up a restaurant or anything, I actually partner with the uh, Mid-Continent Public Library, their Green Hills location, mm-hmm. and I'm bringing my class back probably in February, which is a, it's like a three part series. And I basically teach people like the basics of starting a food service business. I love it. Yep. And then, um, we're having a food business conference at K state also. So Hell yeah. I'll be doing a class over there. That's fire. I love it. So she's around, she's in town and she going to get down in that <laughs> kitchen. Holler at her. It's your boy C I double Z Y back at it again with another episode of the voices of value podcast, where we speak to people who have valuable voices. Peace. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.